Welcome to the NWS Northern Indiana 2017 Spotter Training Program. The National Weather Service Northern Indiana is one of 122 weather service offices nationwide and is open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The National Weather Service Northern Indiana is part of a larger central region which is colored in green and at the Weather Service Northern Indiana we are made up of 23 professionals including 13 forecasters, three administrative meteorologists or managers, four electronic technicians and information technology officers, one observation program leader, one hydrologist, and one administrative assistant. Our office services 37 counties in northern Indiana, southwest lower Michigan, and northwest Ohio. The following is just a picture of our office. You can see the Doppler radar in the background and just a, a picture of a typical workstation in our office where we will conduct our warning operations, look at, uh, at radar data. The critical role you play as spotters cannot be overstated. And one of the big things as a spotter um, that you bring to the whole warning process is you will help weather service forecasters verify what he or she sees on radar, but more importantly, your accurate and timely spotter reports will add credibility to the National Weather Service warnings. We like to think of it as a simple equation that you know, a weather service meteorologist interrogating radar data plus your accurate and timely spotter reports, that is really what equals a credible warning and really drives the public to take action. Just to go over some basic uh, radar concepts here, you can think of our radar on the left side of the screen, this top image, sending out a beam of electromagnetic radiation to sample two storms A and B. Once that radar beam encounters precipitation particles, for example in storm A, it'll send back a portion of that energy back to the radar and the amount of that power returned to the radar can give us some indication as to the intensity of the precipitation. And you can see from in the bottom image from our radar, the radar will send out both horizontally and vertically oriented portions of that beam, which that can really help to tell the shapes of the precipitation particles the radar is sensing, whether it be rain, hail, or snow. There are a couple of products we look at from Doppler radar. On the top here is what we're used to with that portion of the, the energy from the radar beam sent out that gets returned to the radar. That's what we call reflectivity, where you see those darker oranges and darker reds. That's where you have heavier precipitation, getting a higher amount of return power to the radar. But one of the good advantages of Doppler technology is not only are we able to get a sense as to the reflectivity or power returned, but we can see how those precipitation particles are moving. And in this example on this storm here, we're looking at velocity from a storm near the Woodburn, Indiana area during the August 2016 outbreak. And, he, and here you can see red velocities adjacent to green velocities. Now these red velocities indicate precipitation particles moving away from the radar, and the green velocities indicate precipitation particles moving toward the radar. Now with Woodburn here, we're in the Fort Wayne vicinity, so the radar is to the northwest. So you can get a sense as to this proximity of the red and green velocities just indicate a counterclockwise rotation. And this is just an indication that the whole storm is rotating. And this, this storm did produce a tornado um, during that 2016 tornado outbreak. And it's important to remember while the radar will give us a lot of good information, it is not an all-telling tool, which is why spotters are critically needed to fill in those gaps. Here's an example of one radar limitation. Again, the radar on the left here. That beam gets higher in elevation as it leaves our radar. And we're looking at two storms here. The first storm closer to the radar, you can see we're looking at fairly low levels in that storm. But then a second storm much further away from radar, uh, storm B, we're looking at much higher elevations in that storm. So we're going to miss a lot of information in that lower part of storm B. And that's typically where we'll like to look for the tornadic circulations on radar. And we just won't see that uh, due to this limitation of radar with that beam getting, getting higher at greater distances. So we need spotters to fill in that missing information. Like we saw with Storm B on the previous slide where we're missing a lot of lower parts of the storm, here's a real world example of where we're overshooting some of the important characteristics of a thunderstorm. This was a thunderstorm just south of Wanata, Indiana in the springtime where on reflectivity, there's not a whole lot of power return to the radar, fairly weak signature on reflectivity. And in the velocity, you can see a little bit of rotation with those reds and greens next to each other. Nothing very impressive from a radar perspective, 
but we did get a tornado just south of Wanata with this particular storm. And this was an example where the radar was overshooting a lot of the, the important features of this storm and why spotters were critically needed to give us that report of a tornado just south of Wanata. And just to emphasize the radar limitation of the overshooting and that beam getting higher with height at greater distances from the radar, this is a schematic showing our radar at the center of the picture here in northeast Kosciuszko County. And these yellow circles, which we call range rings, tells you the height of the radar beam at different distances from the radar. So you can see as we get out toward portions of northwest Ohio in the Lima area, this radar beam is approximately 10,000 feet above ground level. So there's a, a large part of the storm we're missing at for further distances from the radar. Now fortunately, we are we are able to see surrounding radar sites, and we'll kind of fill those in with these these orange circles. These are surrounding Doppler radars and, and airport radars that give us additional information on storms at greater distances from the radar. But even with the help of these radars, there's still a large part of the lower parts of these storms that we're just not able to see with radar, which is why we need your eyes out in the field to help us determine what's going on with each individual thunderstorm. Now we most commonly think of overshooting these important storm features in terms of summertime thunderstorms, but this also can be important with winter weather, especially in terms of lake effect snow, which can be very intense snow showers, but very shallow, not very high up. And oftentimes the radar beam will overshoot these intense lake effect snow showers, and we just may not get a lot of information from radar. And here's an example uh, from northwest Indiana where the radar was indicating very weak power return and reflectivity, nothing very impressive, but we were getting spotter reports of half mile visibilities on the roads and just uh, very hazardous travel and very slow travel conditions as the heavy snow was occurring under this band um, from Michigan City to Westville. One other radar limitation we want to discuss here is the, ter is the concept of beam broadening. This just refers to how is the the radar beam leaves the radar at short distances from the radar. The beam width is fairly small, but as we get toward greater locations from the radar, that beam gets wider and wider. Now, once that, if the beam is small, we can kind of resolve some of these smaller scale circulations pretty well. But once we get out past 100 miles, we may miss some of these smaller features, which can be tornadic circulations. They may get smeared out or averaged out as the beam gets broader. And this makes it difficult to identify some of these important features we could look at for tornadic storms. An example of this can be seen from a Central Plains radar where there were some supercells in the area. We'll talk about those later, but the radar is on the far left side of this image, and this storm is pretty much right on top of the radar, and you can see a lot of detail in the reflectivity. Some sharp edges, sharp gradients to the reflectivity, but then another storm, a similar storm in terms of structure, much further east, you can see a lot of these features are smoothed out, not as sharp and crisp looking. And this is just due to the fact that as the beam gets further away from the radar, we're kind of getting that beam broadening occurring and just not resolving everything we can as a, with the storms when they're closer to the radar. Now we touched on this briefly before, but one of the, the key most important elements that why it's so critical to get good spotter reports is because the public is more likely to heed a National Weather Service warning when an actual report has been confirmed. And recently there has been a new addition to National Weather Service warnings, and that's been the concept of impact-based warnings. And these warnings contain tags, they're very similar to our previously issued warnings, but they contain tags at the bottom of the warning to better communicate the threat. In this example from the August 2016 tornado outbreak, you can see there's an indication in this tornado tag whether a tornado is radar indicated or observed, in this case observed, and also the tornado damage threat tag, which can give you an indication as to the extent of damage which is expected with a particular tornado, in this case considerable. And also the hail size is also included at the bottom of the particular warning indicating the expected hail size for that storm. So just remember that that formula, the weather service warnings plus ground truth from your spotter reports, that really is what drives the public to take action. Well, in addition to driving public response, there are several other uh, reasons for a good spotter database and stressing the value of your spotter reports. The Weather Service uses your reports to calculate verification stats, and that helps us to improve our performance. We'll go back and look at previous cases 
and treat them like they're real-time cases. We kind of go through the exercises treating it like it's real-time, but we only can learn from those exercises if we have a good ground truth database to work with, and that's where your spotter reports become involved. And also, quality spotter reports are helpful in maintaining historical records uh, for academic research and for emergency response reasons to help mitigate natural disasters and provide effective response in terms of the emergency management community. Also, a well-crafted spotter report, including the key components of a spotter report, help assure that all partners maintain a consistent message. These partners include a wide range of, of components, such as emergency management, local and national media, Department of Homeland Security, and amateur radio emergency service, to name a few. Now, a consistent message helps convey the degree of the impact more accurately, which can enhance the sense of urgency and encourage the public to take action. And by driving public action, the effective spotter reports can ultimately help mitigate loss and facilitate recovery after the event.